Hello, this is Deacon Bob again here at St. Peter Claver Church in West Hartford. We are again doing our second installation on the near-death experience and what it entails. Now, the near-death experience, uh, one of the best ways to try to understand this is that something occurs to people when they've gone through traumatic injury, uh, an auto accident, a heart attack, or something where they weren't anticipating this happening. And as a consequence, uh, when they go through the experience, they come back clearly with a changed perspective on life. But this can also occur with people who ha are uh, terminally ill, who prior to their death, usually about four weeks out, they begin to experience uh, visions of uh, people who have died before them, who have come to tell them and to be there with them uh, that they will be taking them home. And these uh, visions become more frequent as they approach actually their time of their physical death. Looking at that from a Christian perspective, some people will ask me, well, what is the church's official position on these near-death experiences? I can tell you that there isn't any. I think uh, we are watching this. We are trying to understand it. Catholic Church, of course, has a long history of dealing with such experiences based upon the great mystics and contemplatives in the Roman Catholic tradition who often speak of the similar kinds of experiences after you know years of deep prayer and contemplation. And so we... Uh, in some respects, are kind of familiar, at least, with the discussion and the vocabulary that's often used to describe these events. I thought I'd begin today with a description of a, a by a woman who went through one of these types of experiences that you find in the book Recollections of Death uh, by Dr. Michael Sabum, who is an Atlanta cardiologist who began studying this phenomenon when some of his patients began to raise these issues as they had gone through these types of experiences. And uh, it says this, it says, I knew something was going to happen and then I went unconscious and I was looking down and I could see myself going into convulsions and I started to fall out of bed. And the girl in the next bed started screaming for the nurses. It was like a feeling of height, great distance, a light feeling, like being up in a balcony looking down and watching all of this and feeling very detached as though I was watching someone else, like you might watch a movie. It was very calm, relaxed feeling, a feeling of well-being, if anything. And that is one of the uh, fundamental pieces of the initial part of this experience for those who go out of body or at least speak of that they describe it as being out of the traumatic situation and really kind of looking down and observing this from a distance. Uh, doctors will often report those experiences that patients, patients will tell them about uh, while they were in surgery. And of course, some doctors didn't know what to make of this, but others have begun to take this more seriously. Uh, we have probably one of the most impressive events of an out-of-body experience, two people come to mind. Uh, but I want to talk about one in particular, which is Pam Reynolds. At least that's the name she goes by in a documentary called The Day I Died by the BBC. Uh, Pam had been diagnosed with an aneurysm in the base of her uh, skull, and <clears throat> they could not do what you would consider to be regular surgery. So what they had to do is actually uh, affect clinical death in her, they drained the blood from her veins, from her body, and uh, they had taped her eyes shut, brought her body temperature down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, this went on for a few hours as they attempted to, to get inside and to fix the aneurysm in her brain. Uh, <clears throat> once the actual surgery began, uh, she describes that while she had, was clinically dead, that she popped out of her body and was watching the doctors using a brain saw or skull saw, bone saw, to get into the skull to 
get to the point where they could access the aneurysm. At that point, after she saw that, she went on a uh, you know, typical near-death experience. She, she ended up standing in all this white light, and she asked someone who was there in the experience with her, is this white light God? And they said, no, this is what happens when God breathes. And Pam's immediate reaction was, I am standing in the breath of God. Now, something interesting happened. She was feeling pretty good at this point. She was enjoying the experience. She was out of pain. She was out of distress. And her uncle, who had passed, came to her and told her that she had to go back, that it wasn't her time. Now, she resisted this till eventually uh, her uncle pushed her back into her body. This is the kind of thing which is most extraordinary. Though she was induced into clinical death, and for some time, she didn't suffer any brain effects. Uh, you know, there was no brain damage for lack of oxygen uh, or blood circulating in the brain. Uh, and she came back uh, with this extraordinary story. Of course, the difficult thing, one of the most difficult aspects of these experiences is what they call re-entry, that is coming back into the world as you know it, as we all know it on our day-to-day -day lives, and somehow living out uh, what once was a normal life, which for these people simply uh, is seemingly impossible. On the average, I think we stated this in our last uh, in, uh, you know, installment of this, that uh, it probably takes a good 10 years to integrate the experience, but, and, and, and that's really difficult because if people have no one really to speak to and the family of an experiencer doesn't have anyone to speak to, it can be very, very difficult on the family and on the individual. Um, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, who really came to notoriety when she began to actually work with dying patients, uh, has one person report, you know, I was there. I was on the other side. For a long time, that was all I could say. I still get tears in my eyes thinking about the experience too much. It's simply too much for human words. An intense, pure love compared to which Love in our human dimension pales into insignificance, a mere shadow of what it could be. Everything I saw was suffused with indescribable love. That was typical of the patients that Dr. Ross has worked with. And this also was the experience of uh, a cardiologist named uh, Pin Van Lamo. He is a physician, a cardiologist, who... Uh, had experienced uh, this type of uh, story uh, that some of his patients were telling him. And he's written a number of books and articles on this particular phenomenon, and is certainly worth looking at. The, one of the books that, has, uh, that was, we actually reviewed and uh, discussed in the parish was called Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of Near-Death Experience, which was written by Dr. Pinlamo. He has since become convinced that the human mind uh, exists in what we would call non-local uh, dimension. That is, uh, it, it, it's not simply anchored to the brain, but actually is existing in a dimension that has no limitations. So that he would suggest, uh, as a consequence of these experiences, that uh, that the mind and the body uh, are unique and distinct, that you can't confuse the brain either with the mind, while the, the brain seems to be what some, uh, what Dr. Aben Alexander would refer to as a reducing valve. That is something that the mind uses to live in this world, because we have various limitations in this world, and so the mind uses the brain to navigate through this world. So the mind and the brain are deeply interconnected, but they are not the same thing, according to these recent studies. Um, we, I think we have to also talk about what's the impact of these experiences on people. I have one particular uh, um, story that someone tells about how this experience impacted them. It says this, before I was living for material possessions, 
Before I was conscious of only me, what I wanted, I went from a person who was selfish, empty, vain, completely vain, frightened of life, of living, of death, of anything and everything, to a real sense of freedom in my inmost being, a complete sense of knowledge with God. I've grown to really know what love is in a universal sense, and I'm still growing in that area. And this is typical of these experiences that people will simply uh, take on a whole different vision of life and live for the better. Often their lives become markedly better, but some people still struggle with the effects of this chiefly because they feel they don't fit here anymore. And if they don't have someone who's knowledgeable to speak to them about what they're experiencing, um, they can be really quite tormented by this uh, uh, for a number of different reasons. For some people, they feel like uh, here they were, they had gone home, and they were forced to come back here. Uh, that is extraordinarily difficult for them. Now, uh, for some of the people who go through these, not everyone, but some of them have what we call panoramic life review. Uh, the panic life review is a three-dimensional, 360-degree review of your life, everything you've ever said, done, thought, uh, everything that is your experience, you have to review that. And the upshot, too, of this is that when you go through the review, you actually begin to see how you've impacted on the lives of others and they on you. Uh, one of the most striking things about this is you take the role of the other person. So if, if you have extended kindness and love and generosity, concern to another, that's what you experience in those people. If, on the other hand, you've been a particularly hurtful person, doing nasty things to people, uh, being brutal and selfish, you begin to see the world through the eyes of those other people, in fact, through their particular persona. So maybe, as we said last time, the, uh, the advice that Jesus gives, you know, do unto others is really you're doing unto yourself. So do the right thing unto other people, as we stated in the last session. Now, what is the role of the panoramic life review seems to be a corrective or it's supposed to be educational. It's to help you to somehow modify the way you're living so that you can live better and live in the context of loving. Now, there are four basic kinds of experiences that PMA Chatwater, who's the world's leading researcher on near-death experience, and a near-death experiencer herself three times, uh, kind of delineates. And there are four basic experiences I want to go over with you today. One is the initial experience. The initial experience involves elements like a loving nothingness, no thingness is a better way to put it, the living dark, a friendly voice, and out-of-body experiences. These things are what she would refer to as seed experiences that, that help to people uh, to see life in a different way. Okay? Then there may be unpleasant or hell-like experiences. Such experiences are characterized by an encounter with a threatening void, hellish purgatory, and even demon-like creatures, usually experienced, but not always, by those who seem to have deeply suppressed or repressed guilt, fear, or anger. These experiences seem to be rare, and they seem to be an opportunity for the person to experience an inner cleansing and a new direction in life. Uh, people have been puzzling about these uh, in negative ones because they sometimes happen to people whose lives were really uh, not bad lives. In fact, they generally were very virtuous. Uh, even some of the great saints, like uh, Teresa the Little Flower, had visions of a hellish like experience. Um, and researchers are sometimes prone to suspect that maybe these are glimpses into the possibilities of the choices that people can make in lives, whether they can create a heaven or hell for people and for themselves, certainly is in the power of human beings. Uh, the third thing she marks is pleasant or heaven-like experiences. Now, many people experience a heaven-like or illuminative experiences where there's scenarios of loving family reunions with those who have died previously, reassuring religious figures and light beings, validation that life counts, affirmative, and inspiring dialogues. Uh, she noted, especially Atwater has noted, that even those who have attempted suicide 
uh, may actually have these very positive experiences because that's what they needed. And that's what Atwater seems to believe that people get what they need to grow spiritually for some reason. All our journeys are different and we may need a different kind of stimulus to move us in the right direction. Transcendent experiences, that would be the fourth type. Many people experience being exposed to otherworldly dimensions of greater revelation and truth. And when people come and talk to those things, of course, it's difficult for many of us to understand what they're really saying. But these folks are convinced that they have seen something extraordinary. And when they come back here, they don't see this as, quote unquote, the real world. The real world is the world they saw. This they see as kind of like a, a stage or oh, a television show or a dream. You know, uh, Roger Ebert, before he passed, uh, you know, he was very, very sick. The film critic uh, said to his wife, this is all a setup job. Um, this isn't the real deal. So he had gotten a glimpse. Uh, when Steve Jobs was on his deathbed, just before he passed, he started saying, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Which is the sense that things have, the curtain seems to be pulled away so we can see what's real. So when people often speak of, you know, you've got to live in the real world, maybe this isn't the real, real world. It's the world we live in right now. We have to deal with the realities we face, but the real world, based on what these people are saying, is a world of unconditional acceptance and love, which is supposed to be who we are and certainly our future. And I think we, we, we can conclude today with a couple uh, uh, how does this impact on people? Uh, there are two basic categories we look at. One is the psychological impacts it has on people. So we could say psychological, spiritual, and we want to know what the physiological impact uh, on people. You know, how does it affect their physiology, their, their bodies? Psychologically, clearly, many of them manifest a loss of the fear of death. They tend to be more spiritual. Now, that doesn't mean they become necessarily more religious. A lot of people leave organized religion not because they reject so much the, obviously, belief in God. They actually get a deeper belief in God. But sometimes those religion traditions seem to be too confining, especially if there's too much emphasis on evil and guilt and sin. Uh, they say, well, yeah, those are realities here, but that's not what we're supposed to emphasize. And so they tend to back off because they've had this more intimate experience. They tend to see the gathering in the religious ritual as uh, not appealing to them as much uh, as it once did. Uh, they, they tend to uh, engage in abstract thought much more easily than they did prior to this. Uh, they, can, they tend to be more philosophical and profound. They may go through bouts of depression feeling you know, I've been kicked out of heaven. What did I do to have to come back here? Things like that. Uh, they can be more creative and certainly more inventive than they once were. Uh, you will see this in some of the people we'll look at later on in the program. Uh, an unusual sensitivity to light and sound becomes an issue for some folks, so they need to be careful there. Uh, many of them have either substantially more or less energy than they once had. Uh, for instance, uh, sexually, the libido can come back from Toledo, so to speak, uh, for some people. And, uh, you know, this may be uh, overpowering at times for people. So again, there's this attempt, they have to kind of reintegrate this uh, type of thing. Reversal of the body clock, uh, that is physically, they seem to be better. Uh, some people actually look younger. If you do before and after pictures, there's a luminosity in the second kind of uh, picture, the after. Uh, one of the things I've noticed with some experience is their eyes tend to glisten. Uh, glisten much like people who are deep into things like yoga and qigong and tai chi on a very regular and serious basis. You begin to see their eyes kind of more uh, sparkling and so forth because this life energy seems to be very powerful in them. Uh, lower of blood pressure, and this is important. It can have a an, an effect uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the medications that people take for blood pressure. So it'd be good for them to kind of check with their physician if they've gone through something like this. Um, the, the, one of the things that can come up for some people is they gain healing abilities or psychic abilities. 
which today we're beginning to understand has genuine basis, a uh, number of controlled studies by reputable institutions and uh, researchers is clearly beginning to tell us that there is more to us than simply the material body. And in fact, the mind has more power than even we once thought. Uh, as far as the, uh, one of the things is too, as far as is this, this hunger for knowledge and people feel less stressed, you see. And that's one of the major issues. Uh, the, the desire to learn and to like be voracious in their learning. Oh, if only my students in school were like that. Well, they're all, they're, they're good kids, but yeah. Anyway, uh, one of the things too, in terms of the, uh, the physical, uh, we, we made reference to some just recently, but um, the sense of almost spontaneous healing where uh, you'll get somebody like uh, Anita Marjani who wrote a book, Dying to Me, Me, where she was stage four cancer and she was at death's door. I mean, the tumors were huge, they were all over. And within a couple of weeks, she left the hospital uh, clear of cancer. Now, uh, she suggests that some of that cancer was based upon the way she saw life, that in some way, her deep self had manifested in her body the illness she had in her spirit. And we do hear that from a number of these uh, folks, that in many of our physical uh, maladies can often be deeply rooted in our spiritual self, which is something for us to think about. Maybe we need to attend more to our spiritual lives than we originally thought. It's not obviously just going to mass or to your religious service, but a, a profound cultivation in the presence of God in our lives and the positive effects that that can have for us. Uh, some people will have a thing called synesthesia where they experience things in multiple senses all at the same time. You know, like they'll smell colors or, or feel uh, um, numbers. and It's just a, it's something which is so unusual. Uh, we have human beings who do have that, but they're very rare. But in these experiences, this can be a part of it. Um, what are the after effects of this for most folks? They're, they come in two basic packages. Uh, one is a uh, very positive, one is rather challenging. The ecstatic experience at the wonder and beauty of the experience for some people, it, they are simply overwhelmed by it. And even when they come back here, they see the beauty in the flowers and the trees and human beings, especially, uh, even though sometimes human beings um, don't present themselves always that way. They're thrilled at being privileged to have had the experience. There's a sense of blessing for many of them. They're grateful that anything so incredible could have happened to them. Um, they become almost evangelistic and desiring to tell everybody about their experience. And, and they tend to be humbled by the magnitude of what happened to them. Uh, this is typical. Uh, why me? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who generally has been very religious or spiritual, but I guess I was picked. And, and so there's a sort of humility and gratefulness at the same time for this experience. Uh, for those who, uh, there are other reactions as well, sometimes anger. Anger for having been revived and forced to leave where they are or have been. I have run into a couple people who told me that when they were resuscitated, they were royally angry at the doctors and, and, and people couldn't understand that. And the reason being is they will tell you, I was fine. Why did you do this? Now I got to go through this all over again. It kind of reminds me some years ago when I was teaching about the resurrection of Lazarus that Jesus uh, does in uh, John's gospel. One of my students said, you know, don't you think Lazarus was a bit angry? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if he was where we, we think he was, which is in God's presence, uh, wouldn't he be kind of upset to come back here? Uh, I mean, he's got to go through this all over again. And I said to him, you know, you got a point there, okay? I don't know what Lazarus' reaction would be. I said, but if it's anything like what these people have gone through, he might not have been too excited about this. Um, many people will feel guilty for not missing or even being concerned about their loved ones. You know, they didn't want to come back here, not that they don't love their husbands, wives, or kids, or whatever, uh, but where they were was home for them. Uh, they're disappointed at discovering that they're once again in the physical body, which Car uh, Carl Jung, who was the great psychotherapist and, and one of the founders of modern depth psychology, 
uh, went through an experience like this and he said, I was so upset I had to go back into the box, you know, which was this world, which is fairly limited and confining. Gum found that if they want to talk about it, they can't or are afraid to talk about the experience. Some people, it's just too overpowering to put it into words. Depression at realizing they must now resume their former lives and that they couldn't stay where they were once before. Uh, that is extremely difficult. I was talking to a woman who's a, an APRN and she felt the same way, trying to get back into the world that she had known was becoming extremely difficult. Uh, she just was not focused the way she was prior to the experience. And of course, that can take, as we said, 10 years before people get back into the flow of things. We've had, I had one guy told me, you know, I, I was a policeman, I had to leave that uh, because I just even, couldn't even contemplate uh, shooting somebody in the line of duty. He says, uh, you know, it took me two years, but now I can actually sit through a football game. Uh, he just could not understand violence after that, why we do what we do to each other. So the impact of this is rather profound on people. We're going to look at a few things in upcoming installments on the program. We want to look at what is it like, what, what do people tell us it's like when they have passed and then come back. In other words, what was that experience like directly for them? We also want to look at the fact that some people actually share in the near-death experience who are members of the family or those in the room with the dying person. So we want to look at that. We also want to look at the work being done by Dr. John Lerma, who is the director of hospice at the Anderson uh, Cancer Center in uh, Texas. It is the world leading uh, center for cancer treatment. And uh, he has some extraordinary experiences to talk about as a hospice director there. So we're going to leave it here for now. We will come back to this topic again in our third installment. So please uh, continue to, to watch this pro program. Also remember, I'm still doing a series on the scriptures uh, for the parish, and we'll be doing our sixth installment of that this week. In the meantime, I hope everybody is safe. Continue to shelter in place. Um, remember, things will get better eventually, and we will somehow get through all this. In the meantime, I ask for your prayers for uh, all those who have passed, but also for all those who are healthcare workers who are in a direct line of fire for this, uh, this virus, that we hold them in our prayers and support them whichever way we can. See you next time. God bless.